I'd like to welcome everybody to our penultimate webinar in the WISH Centennial Series. In this 100th anniversary of Rosalind Franklin's birth, we've had the pleasure of welcoming 10 remarkable scientists and clinicians who are either speaking about women's advancement in STEM or demonstrating it through their own accomplishments. Today's speaker has done both, conducted groundbreaking research in psychology and advocated powerfully on behalf of women in her field and all of STEM. Janet Chibley Hyde is the Helen Thompson Woolley Professor of Psychology and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has two doctoral degrees, the first from UC Berkeley and the second, uh, an honorary degree from Denison University where she rose through the faculty ranks before moving to Madison. Dr. Hyde's research is remarkably wide ranging from sexuality to health psychology, body image, depression, interventions to close achievement gaps, and her greatest claim to fame, carefully quantifying every dimension of gender similarity and difference in psychology. Her research has been funded by numerous grants from the NIH, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and especially the National Science Foundation. Dr. Hyde is author of over 200, book, uh, 200 papers and seven books, including two widely used textbooks, Understanding Human Sexuality Now in its 14th edition, <clears throat> and The Psychology of Women and Gender, Half the Human Experience, which will soon be released in its 10th edition. Among these hundreds of publications, I'd like to highlight just two, her seminal 2005 paper, The Gender Similarities Hypothesis, which posed and proved the radical notion that men and women are actually much more similar than different across the vast majority of psychological traits. And this has been a great inspiration for my own work on brain gender similarities. Uh, that paper, Dr. Hyde's paper published in American Psychologist received the George A. Miller Award for best paper from the American Psychological Association and the Distinguished Publication Award from the uh, Association for Women in Psychology. And the second paper I'd like to highlight is the topic of her talk today, The Future of Sex and Gender in Psychology, Five Challenges to the Gender Binary, which was published in American Psychologist in 2019 and winner of the same two awards. So please help me welcome Janet Hyde to Rosalind Franklin University for her talk, The Future of Gender and Sex in Science, Five Challenges to the Gender Binary. And please note that the CME announcements can be found in the chat link and uh, please put your questions in the, in the Q&A box. So welcome, welcome Dr. Hyde. Thank you so much, Lise, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be with all of you here today. And, and I hope that uh, I'll present some interesting and perhaps novel ideas for you. Trying to move the okay there. So um, as as Lisa said, the title of the talk is "The Future of Gender and Sex in Science: Five Challenges to the Gender Binary," and this paper appeared in the American Psychologist in 2019. Well, there we go. At first, the PowerPoint wasn't responding. Uh, so I'm going to give you an overview for first of the, the five sections to this talk. Um, and you'll see a right across the bottom there, the five of us who collaborated on this paper. I couldn't have begun to do it by myself. And I'll introduce you to each one of them individually uh, as, as I uh, tell you about their section of part, the paper and the argument. So we'll go over the challenge from neuroscience. Uh, the question, is there a female brain or a male brain? The challenge from behavioral neuroendocrinology, estrogen versus testosterone, male hormones and female hormones. The challenge from psychology, gender similarities and differences. The challenge from research with transgender individuals. And finally, the challenge from developmental psychology. Is it inevitable that children will learn to categorize everyone by gender? First, let me begin by defining the gender binary, a term that we hear quite a bit these days. Uh, we can define the gender binary as the belief that there are two discrete separate categories 
into which all individuals can be sorted. And those two categories are male and female. The gender binary has several assumptions underlying it. The first is that there are two, and only two, categories, and that they're discrete, that is non-overlapping, separate categories. A second assumption is that category membership is biologically determined. Uh, there, there's no environmental input. There's nothing the individual can do about it. A third assumption is that category membership is clear at birth based on the appearance of the genitals. A fourth assumption is that category membership is stable over time. That is, uh, once you're a female at birth, you're going to be a female for the rest of your life. A fifth assumption is that category membership is meaningful to the self. That is that I care that I'm a, a woman. It's important to me, my, to my identity. You care about uh, you being a, a man and that's important to your identity. And a sixth assumption is that category membership strongly predicts psychological attributes such as abilities and behavior. That is, if you know the gender of a person, you're going to know how good they are at math, whether they're apt to get depressed, and so on. Now, in this paper, we use the term gender slash sex, and I'll pronounce that gender sex, um, to signify that the biological and sociocultural are typically inseparable. And I know when I work with biologists, a lot of them uh, are, are wedded to the notion that sex is the biological part of you that's determined, you know, by your genitals at birth and so on. And the gender is sociocultural. It has to do with gender roles and gender identity and so on. But in fact, there is such a, a bi-directional influence between biology and the sociocultural that really it's almost impossible to separate out the biological and, and the cultural. So we use the term gender sex. Let's look at the first challenge, the challenge from neuroscience. Is there such a thing as the female brain? So are human brains binary? Do they fall into sep two separate categories, male and female? Certainly, this is an idea much publicized in the popular press. Um, here we have one example, Luann Brizendine's book, The Female Brain. Luann Brizendine is a psychiatrist. Uh, she actually didn't do the research discussed in the book. She was reporting on other people's research. That book has sold so well. It became a huge success. People are attracted to this notion that there is a female brain. It was so successful that she published a companion volume, The Male Brain, which apparently is made out of duct tape. The book was so successful that it's been translated into many other languages uh, like Spanish and German. I think that's Portuguese and Greek. So this book has influenced people's thinking around the globe. But is it accurate? That's the science question. This brings me to the research of Daphne Joel, one of the collaborators on this 2019 paper. I'm going to convey to you what Daphne jo Joel says, although I'm, I'm, I completely agree with that, but it's her, it's her work that I'm talking about here. So according to Daphne Joel's argument, for brains to be sexually dimorphic, and that tends to be the term the biologists use, di meaning two and morph meaning forms, so two different forms, one form for males, one form for females. So if brains are going to be sexually dimorphic, then for each region of the brain for a particular feature, the distributions for males and females would have to be non-overlapping. They have to be two separate categories, not overlapping distributions. So we'd be looking at a situation like this in which perhaps the dashed red line is the distribution of scores for females on this trait and 
the black solid line is the distribution of scores for males on this trait. What might the trait be? It might be something like the size of the hippocampus, or it, I'm, I'm going to use examples about volume a, a lot, but, uh, but we can have other measures like densities of cannabinoid receptors in the hippocampus. Now, not, not only for the, for the brain to be sexually dimorphic, not only would uh, the distribution for a particular region have to be non-overlapping for males and females, there would also have to be internal consistency in an individual brain. That is, for a given region, all, re all for a given brain, all the regions would have to be female or all the regions would have to be male so that we color coding in blue is for boys and pink is for girls. This would be a boy's brain. Uh, all the regions are in the, pink, uh, are in the blue part of the distribution. For girls, pink, all of the regions would have to be in the female part of the distribution. Now, uh, one of the studies, I'm going to tell you about just one of Daphne Joel's studies. This was in PNAS in 2015, and she's done a number of other studies with similar outcomes since then. But for this 2015 study, she analyzed the MRI scans of 1,400 human brains uh, put together from four different data sets. She and her team extracted a lot of measures from each of those scans, such as the volumes of 116 different brain regions, and also measures like connectivity. She uses a color coding scheme, and I want to explain it to you because it's how she shows her data. Uh, so we have a distribution of scores for some, for some trait. Let's say it's the size of the hippocampus. She codes that from green at one end uh, to white in the middle. So we have green for the people who have exceptionally large hippocampi, uh, white for people whose scores are in the middle of the distribution, and then yellow for people who have a smaller hippocampus. So this is how she shows her data from that study of 1,400 brains. So on the left here, we have what she calls the great wall of female brains, and on the right, the great wall of male brains. And this is the most amazing example of a concise showing of a whole lot of data all in one graph. So how do we interpret this? These are the results from female brains. And each one of these tiny, narrow little lines going across represents the scores for one individual female brain. And they're color coded with that same thing, green being the female end of the distribution, white being the middle part of the distribution, neither male nor female, and yellow being the male part of the distribution. The reason this wall is smaller than this wall is just that they had fewer male brains. So what you see is that the male wall is a little more yellow and the female wall is a little more green. But on the whole, there's a lot of yellow in the midst of all the green for the female brains and a lot of green in the midst of all the yellow for the male brains. And at the bottom here, you can see a, an extraction of 10 data for 10 regions from one person's brain, this very last brain from a man. Uh, and you can see the color coding there. So one of the re regions is in the female range, one is pretty neutral, and then others are more in the yellow part of the distribution. So Daphne Joel's conclusion from this research is that each human brain is a gender sex mosaic. That is, it's not, I don't have a female brain. I, you don't have a female brain or a male main brain. Each, each one of our brains is a gender sex mosaic possessing features that are more characteristic of males on average and more characteristics of female, females on average and lots in the middle. Daphne Joel also says, that human brains are intersex, using the metaphor that we have for 
um, babies born with ambiguous genitals. Genitals are somewhere in between typical masculine and typical feminine. Okay, that was argument one about neuroscience. Here's argument two, the challenge from the challenge to the gender binary from behavioral neuroendocrinology. Are there male hormones and female hormones, just like we've talked about male and female brains? So we tend to think of sex hormones also as being binary in nature. Two categories, two boxes, one for men's hormones and one for women's hormones. Testosterone is in the box for men, estrogen and progesterone in the box for women. And we tend to talk about testosterone as being a, quote, male hormone, and estrogen and progesterone as being, quote, female hormones. So we think about sex hormones as being uh, gender binary. Is that accurate? Well, when we look at overall levels of these sex steroid, steroids in humans, and this, these studies surprised me when I first learned about them. They may surprise you, too. Um, they show that average levels of estradiol, the main estrogen, the la average levels of estradiol do not differ between men and women, contrary to popular belief. Average levels of progesterone do not differ between women and men. Again, contrary to popular belief. Um, it is true that average levels of testosterone are higher in adult men compared with adult women, but the distributions uh, overlap. The di distributions of the levels overlap between the male distribution and the female distribution. By the way, if you want to read more about testosterone, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with this book. Uh, Cordelia Fine is an Australian psychologist who's also just a marvelous writer. She's probably as good as Dr. Lise Elliott. And she has this book called Testosterone Rex, uh, Myths of Sex, Science, and Society. And it's just, it's like brain candy. You know, it's so much fun to read. So if you have a little time on a vacation or something, I would urge you to pick up that book. Lots of surprising findings in it. Now, let me tell you about Sari Van Ander's research. Uh, and she's a behavioral neuroendocrinologist. And her research, is, she's one of the co-authors on this paper. Sari Van Ander's research shows, I mean, bottom line, is that testosterone levels are not fixed. Specifically, they change in response to social experiences. For example, one of Sari Van Ander's studies showed that engaging in nurturing parenting behaviors decreases testosterone levels in men, this interactions with their own babies. Another study by Sari Van Ander's found that thinking sexual thoughts increases testosterone levels in women. Simply sitting in a lab and being asked to imagine sexual ideas, uh, that will increase women's testosterone levels. I want to go into more detail about one uh, particular study from Sarah Van Anders. And in this study, it, it, coincidentally also in PNAS 2015, uh, in this study, Sari recruited male and female actors who were then trained to perform a workplace monologue. And this is a study about power, the, the hormonal consequences of, of power. So they enacted a workplace monologue in which they enacted power by firing an employer. They were acting as the boss and they were firing someone. Their testosterone levels were measured both before and after enacting this workplace monologue. The results displaying power increased testosterone levels for women. It didn't for men, but I think that's probably because their levels were somewhat higher on to, uh, already. But it, it showed a, a demonstrable increase in testosterone levels for women. 
This leads to the provocative question of whether men's more frequent displays of power in our society and women's lack of displays of power, whether th those difference in power displays don't contribute to the gender difference in testosterone levels. And of course, this makes one think of a former reality star celebrity who repeatedly act, interacted, uh, enacted this power display of saying you're fired to con contestants. First, he did that in reality TV, and then he did it in reality, in which as president, he frequently fired people. Makes you wonder if he gets a testosterone jolt every time he does that. Okay, that was the behavioral neuroendocrinology part. Next, let me move along to the challenge from psychology, gender differences and similarities, and this is my work. We also tend to think about a psychological gender binary, and that is in the form of gender stereotypes. People believe that men are aggressive and women aren't, that men are good at math and women aren't, that women are verbally skilled and men aren't, that women become depressed and men don't. These are all psychological beliefs in a gender binary. They're all gender stereotypes. Now, I use uh, a statistical technique called meta-analysis to assess the magnitude of psychological gender differences. And I'm guessing that quite a few of you in the audience know about meta-analysis, but also some of you don't. So I'm, I'm going to do a quick explanation so that everybody is with me on, on this research uh, idea. Um, I've conducted meta-analyses of gender differences in math performance, in self-esteem, in sexuality, and in depression. Okay, what do we, what do we mean by the method of meta-analysis? We can think of it as a quantitative literature view of a particular question. More formally, we can define meta-analysis as a method for quantitatively combining the results of numerous studies on a given question. And let's say our question is gender differences in math performance. Now, the nice thing about meta-analysis is that it tells us not only whether there is a difference, but also how big the difference is. Is it a teeny tiny difference, a medium-sized difference, or a big difference? Meta-analysis has really become the gold stand for, standard for conclusions in a number of areas, including medicine, meta-analyses, for example, of drug trials, comparing drug versus placebo and the outcomes uh, in education, uh, classroom interventions, for example, and in psychology, which is where I work on it. We go through a number of steps in conducting a meta-analysis. The first is to locate all prior studies on the question. Let's say our question is gender differences in math performance, so we're going to try to find all those prior studies. Uh, it's much easier to do this today because we have such great online databases of articles like PsychInfo and Web of Science and Medline and so on. So we can do a really good job of finding all these prior studies. Once we've uh, located all these studies, and let's say we found 100 studies of gender differences in math performance, we extract statistics from each of those 100 studies, and we compute an effect size called D for each study, and I'll show you the formula for D on the next slide. Once we have a D computed for each study, we compute a weighted average D averaged over all studies. And that's how big the gender difference is when you put all of the data together. That's why this is such a powerful technique. Uh, so here's the formula for that statistic D, the size of the gender difference. And by the way, you can do this for any two group design, like if you were talking about um, 
uh, clinical trials of drugs, drug compared with placebo, but I'm showing you the application here for gender differences. So the formula for D is the mean score. This big M is mean score for males minus the mean score for females. So that's how far apart the average scores are for males and females. But in this meta-analysis of gender differences in math performance, probably some of the studies measured uh, math on a 50-point scale and another study on a 100-point scale and another on a 500-point scale. So how are we going to uh, make those differences in means comparable? Well, we do that by dividing by the pooled standard deviation within groups. And that'll put everything on a scale, kind of like a z-score, but it puts everything on the same scale so we can average over all these studies. Uh, a very famous statistician, Jacob Cohen, gave these guidelines for interpreting effect sizes. And I want you to kind of store these in your brain so that you'll be able to interpret what I say for the rest of the talk. So he said that the d value of 0.20 is small. I should say, go back for a second, t can take on either positive or negative values. So if the mean score for males is higher, then you'll have a positive value of D. If, me, if females scored higher, you'll have a negative value. So when I talk about a D value of 0.20, 0 .20 being small, I mean either plus 0 0.20 or minus 0 0.20. A D value of 0 0.50 is medium and 0 0.80 is large. I've been trying to introduce yet a fourth criterion, which is that a D value less than 0 0.10 is trivial and basically no difference. Uh, my reasoning for that is 0 0.10 or less is less than half of small. And I think there are just are some effects in psychology and also in biology where we have to conclude, you know, there's really just not an effect here. To give you some perspective on D values, the gender difference in human height is 2.0, which is huge compared to that 0 0.80 value that I just told you is large. And yet even then we have overlap in the distribution of height between human males and females. Uh, and I'm five feet, 10 inches tall. And I, when I give this in person, I, it's not too hard for me to find a man in the audience who will stand next to me and is shorter than I am. So that's overlap in the distribution, even with a huge value of D like 2.0. I'm going to go into some detail on a meta-analysis of gender differences in math performance, um, partly because math is so important for careers in science, uh, and also because this is a, an area that we've studied very well. So in this our, uh, article, in this study, which was founded by NSF, I should acknowledge them, uh, we, re we got data from annual assessments by states of all children's math performance. And if you're familiar with No Child Left Behind federal legislation, it requires all states to test all pupils um, each year about their math performance and also areas like reading and writing. But that's not what I'm focusing on here. So the thing that occurred to us is that these state assessments have mountains of data that we could be uh, could be analyzing for gender differences in math performance. And the beauty is that it's well sampled because they have to test all kids in the state. There's some exceptions, for example, for private schools and homeschooling. But aside from that, it's all kids in the state. So we contacted the departments of education in all 50 US states. And we asked them for the data we would need to compute D. We had responses from 10 states. I assume that uh, the, the administrators in the other 40 states were too overworked to respond. But we were happy with the 10 states because that represented the testing of more than 7 million children. And this, we can put all those data together. This is the beauty of meta-analysis. I should also say that those 10 states, uh, we compared them on some national measures and they're geographically dispersed. They match national averages on other tests. So I think this is a good sample. What did we find? So these are the D values for gender differences in math performance by grade level. Here are the D values. I'll give you a moment to process those. All of them are in that trivial range, right? And if we average all D values 
over all grades, we come up with 0 0.0065. That, my friends, is no difference, no gender difference in math performance. So for this study, we concluded that girls have reached parity with boys in math performance at all grade levels, so that we have a pattern of gender similarities, not gender differences. Well, by 2005, and Dr. Elliot was kindly mentioned this in her introduction, by 2005, a pattern had become clear to me. I had done quite a few gender meta-analyses, and so had a lot of other people. And the pattern was becoming clear that the gender similarities were small, they were tiny. So I proposed the gender similarities hypothesis in this paper, and it states that men and women are very similar on most, not all, but most psychological variables. What's my evidence for that assertion? I was able at the time to locate 46 meta-analyses, some by me, most by other people, 46 meta-analyses of psychological gender differences. From those 46 meta-analyses, I extracted 124 effect sizes for gender differences. What was the distribution of those effect sizes? 30% of the D values were in that trivial or no difference range between 0 and 0 0.10. An additional 48% were in the range around small. So that means that a total of 78% of gender differences were small or in that trivial close to zero range. So that's the evidence for gender similarities. There are some differences that are larger but they're in the minority. I'm also happy to report that this finding was independently replicated by a team headed by Zell in a 2015 paper. They had lots of new meta-analyses and they came up with almost exactly the same percentages. So, According to the gender similarities hypotheses and just mountains of data from meta-analyses, there's no psychological gender binary contrary to stereotypes. So remember, if we wanted to have a gender binary, we need non-overlapping distributions like this. And I'm, these are hypothetical distributions with the red dashed line for male scores and the, uh, the solid black line for male scores. So we'd have to get out to a D value of 5.0, and you now see how huge that is to get these non-overlapping distributions. Instead, what we have is a lot of effect sizes in the small range, around 0 0.20. This shows you two distributions that are 0 0.20 standard deviations apart. That's what a D value of 0 0.20 means. And as you see, there's almost complete overlap of the distributions at this D value. They become a little bit more spread apart at D equals 0 0.50 and more spread apart at D equals 0 0.80. But even for a large difference like that, there is still substantial overlap in the distributions for males and females. Okay, that was the psychology part. Now we're going to switch to challenge number four, which comes from research with transgender and non-binary people. Uh, according to a, a good epidemiological study, the prevalence of transgender non-binary people in the U.S. is about 0.6 percent, that is less than 1 percent. I hasten to say that that's probably an underestimate. It's very difficult to get at this population and get accurate data, although the, this FLORA study did a good job. I also believe that the prevalence will increase in over the next five to ten years because transgender and non-binary identities are now available and widely known in the population, whereas previously they were really quite hidden. Now, another collaborator on this 2019 paper is Charlotte Chucky Tate, who is herself a trans woman. She's a social psychologist. Research with transgender and non-binary people challenges the gender binary 
in a couple of ways. First, this research shows that biological sex assigned at birth does not always match psychological gender identity. And that you remember when I listed the assumptions of the gender binary, one is that biological sex at birth would be a perfect match to gender identity, and it's just not for TGMB people. Another finding from this research is uh, that, that there are not in binary individuals who don't really identify as male or female, and their very existence challenges the gender binary. And finally, we have challenge number five, the challenge from developmental psychology. Is it inevitable that children and then adults will all learn to category, categorize people and other things by gender? Is that just is that an essential part of development? Well, all children always learn that. Now, we know from a lot of research on infancy and early child that childhood that from a very early age, children learn to sort or categorize others by gender. And some of these findings are surprising how, how uh, at what an early age children do this. For example, by six months of age, children can tell the difference between male and female voices. And this is, infancy researchers do this with listening tests and they look uh, at children will turn toward what they're hearing from the right and the left and so on. They have subtle uh, means and clever means of, um, of seeing whether infants can detect the difference between male and female voices. So that's by six months. By four years of age, children play in gender segregated groups. And it's not because necessarily teachers or parents make them do that. They really want to do that. And, you know, boys believe that girls have cooties and they don't want to get near them because they'll get infected and all kinds of stuff. It's, you know, this gender segregated play emerges. And this is found in many, many cultures. So is this strong tendency of children to categorize by gender, is that tendency inevitable? So this brings us to the research of Becky Bigler, a faculty member at the University of Texas and a developmental psychologist. Her argument is that categorizing others by gender is not innate and it's not inevitable. Instead, children learn this in childhood because of multiple powerful social forces. And these social forces are so widespread that we don't even really notice them. Uh, Becky Bigler and her uh, colleague Lynn Libin articulated many of these ideas and they're based in developmental intergroup theory, if any of you are interested in pursuing more reading on this point. Now, what the research shows is that children categorize others by gender earlier and more rigidly than they do other attributes that they might be, uh, that they might categorize by. For example, they sort by gender earlier and more rigidly than they do by race or than they do by hair color and these are, or eye color and these are very visible characteristics. But children are particularly sensitive to gender categorization. So what are these powerful social forces that lead children? to categorize by gender. Well, according to, Big, Betty Big, <laughs> according to Becky Bigler, um, we heighten the perceptual discriminability of gender sex categories constantly. We do this with children's clothing, for example. And we do it by color signaling that blue is for boys and pink is for girls. Here we have two babies in their onesies, and one of them we know is a boy because he's in a blue onesie, and one's a girl because she's in a pink onesie. We do this with features like putting boy bows in girls' hair. Here is, uh, it actually is painful to me to look at this picture of a little girl who's been entered, I believe, in a, 
uh, in a baby beauty pageant. But look at all the cues to the fact that she's a girl, bows in the hair and a pink dress and, and everything. So we are constantly heightening perceptual discriminability, it, ways that we can tell boys and girls apart, ways that we can te uh, tell boys and men apart. Other forces that lead children to categorize by gender. One of those is the linguistic labeling of gender sex. And that's a, certainly a fe feature of English and, and many other European languages, not of every language, but most languages. A famous social, a social psychologist once said that words serve as invitations to form categories. That is the vocabulary we learn lets us put things in categories psychologically. Becky Bigler's point is that children are flooded with nouns and pronouns that signify gender. The teacher walks into the classroom and says, good morning, boys and girls. Alternatively, the teacher could have said, good morning, children, right? And Bickley, Becky's point is that, uh, that we tend to say boys and girls, and we're saying there are two categories of people here. Uh, a mom is walking along the street with her toddler, and a man does something nice for them, and she said that man was really nice, rather than that person was really nice. In English, we have the problem of the absence of a gender neutral pronoun in the singular. We have only he or she. And people are working to, um, to offset that, for example, by use of singular or they, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes. Uh, I don't think I have time to tell you the elk story. Uh, it, this happened in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I'll, I'll say just quickly, my family and I were, were there hiking around the lake and another family came up and then this adolescent, I think, elk kind of strolled by very close to us, like 15, 20 feet. It was a magical moment. And the other family, not my family, the other family as the elk stro strode back off into the forest said, what's that elk doing here? Where is he going? Now, I could not help but notice that the elk had no antlers and also had no penis. I noticed things like this. So this was not a male elk. Um, it, but this is my illustration of how people just must assign gender to everything, including elks, and even when they're wrong. I then had the personal dilemma about whether I should go up to the people and point out that it was not a male elk. I restrained myself. <laughs> okay. More of these forces that lead children to categorize by gender. We have both explicit and implicit use of gender sex for sorting. For example, we have the boys' restroom and the girls' restroom. We have the girls' basketball team and the boys' basketball team. So the implication from Becky Bigler is that if we reduced or eliminated all of these social practices, we would reduce gender, gender binary thinking in both children and adults. So let me summarize um, over all these arguments from the paper. First, brains are not male or female. Instead, each brain is a gender sex mosaic. Sex hormones do, do not fall into a gender binary. No gender differences in levels of estradiol and progesterone. Uh, and also, levels of sex hormones are not fixed. They change in response to the environment and experience. There's not a psychological gender binary. Instead, gender similarities are common. The existence of transgender and non-binary individuals challenges the gender binary. And the human tendency to sort by gender categories is not innate or inevitable. Now, I want to think just a little bit about implications here quickly, and I know I'm running out of time, but um, research in the behavioral and biological sciences has been based on an assumption of the gender binary. We need to figure out how to move beyond that in our research. 
So a couple of recommendations for research. When we're measuring in humans, when we're measuring gender sex, what are the best questions to ask on surveys? It's not, you don't ask male or female anymore. You need to ask more complicated questions. One recommendation is that you ask two different uh, questions, one about birth assigned sex and one about current gender sex identity. So there's a whole set of methods that are evolving for this issue. We're getting changes in scientific style. For example, American Psychological Association now just in its most recent edition of its publication manual accepts singular they and other alternative pronouns. If we think about clinical practice, both in psychology and medicine, clinicians need to be aware of gender binary thinking. Uh, for example, there are gender stereotypes about mental health. We think of women as getting depressed and men not. And I have a, a meta-analysis on that, which I didn't have time to show. Um, so clinicians need to question their gender binary thinking and their gender stereotypical thinking about issues like depression. We also need to think about competence in healthcare issues for transgender and non-binary folks and competence in mental health issues for TGNB folks. Some people are advocating spelling folks that way now to um, highlight non-binary thinking. So thank you so much for listening. I hope that you've gotten something out of this and I'm happy to respond to questions now. Mm, thank you so much, Janet. That's really um, gives us all a ton to think about. Uh, amazing how uh, concise you could be <laughs> about so much <laughs> research in such a short time. Um, but I, I love the way uh, pulling it together from all these different fields really reinforces this non-binary idea. Um, there is one question currently in the Q&A, so we'll start with that. Um, uh, uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how do you reconcile the existence of distinct gender identity in binary identified trans people with the argument that gender is imposed by gendered characteristics of child rearing? Uh, I wouldn't say, well, certainly there are, there, there is gender related child rearing, but it's true that some trans folks who identify within the binary, but not with their sex assigned at birth, but with the other gender, um, many of them from the word go, you know, time, from the time they're three or four years of age, um, report feeling that they are not the sex that they're being told to be. So it's a violation of this socialization. And we don't totally know why that is, why some children would have that, uh, would have that experience of their identity just not matching what they're being told. Uh, people have done some MRI work on brains and have not identified anything very conclusive yet. So we don't know. I, I, I certainly don't need to discount uh, biological factors completely, but it's uh, uh, it, it, so what causes these kids to have an identity different from the one they were assigned at birth? That's still really kind of a mystery. Yeah, that's one that I've struggled with, too. And the way I tend to think about it is that, um, you know, if the if the binary is a human invention and but everybody sits somewhere on the scale of masculinity and femininity according to this mosaic then the child who might not fit very well in the category decides quite early you know they put me on the wrong team and basically sort of cog evolves cognitively um to to you know realize that they identify much more strongly with the other gender so it's um you know given the fact that so much of it is self self-socialization it uh, I think it is reconciled. Right. Well, and I think the other important point to, to recognize is that some cultures have more than two genders. Some have a third or a fourth. And in those, and they recognize that some kids just don't fit in male or female, and they accord them a special status. And uh, so, so the, the, even the binary conceptualization is not universal across human cultures. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, so let me, there's a few questions that came in through the chat. Let me, um, let me look at these. Uh, Eric writes, thanks, Dr. Hyde. I'm a big fan of your work, especially on gender similarities. I'm a PhD student about to do a meta-analysis on gender differences, similarities, and sexual attitudes. Any tips or advice? What do you think is the future of work in this area? Uh, yeah, well, I, I have a meta-analysis that's now a little bit old on uh, uh, gender differences in sexual behaviors and attitudes. And I think um, the thing to be, if you think about a meta-analysis of gender differences in sexual attitudes, attitudes have changed so rapidly uh, about, about sexuality over the last five to ten years as witnessed by the 2015 Supreme Court decision uh, legalizing same-sex marriage. Um, it, and so I would really pay attention to time, the time at which the data were collected, uh, because some attitudes have just shifted so drastically. Um, okay, and um, another question are your uh, thoughts about how the dynamic levels of testosterone can affect male-female marriages. If a woman has more power than her husband, how could it affect their relationship or interactions? And, and conversely, a man in a position with high power. Well, that's interesting. And it makes me think of a study I'd love to do. I, I, I don't have the resources to do it. But uh, wouldn't it be fascinating? Because we now know that, I, I, maybe Elise will know this, this number, but it's something like 27% or 30% of male-female marriages in the United States today, the, the woman earns more than the man, although that was before the pandemic, and the pandem pandemic has unseated a lot of things. So wouldn't it be interesting to look at testosterone levels in couples where the woman earns, earns more than the man and vice versa? Uh, and then, of course, you would wonder if... Uh, it, if it turned out that that the women who earn more have higher testosterone levels than their husbands, it would make you wonder whether those were pre-existing higher testosterone levels, which maybe made them more, and uh, you know, who knows, ambitious, active, you know, whatever traits are necessary for success in the business world. So, yeah, that, that's a very intriguing question. Um, yeah, and. Uh... Oh, there's the questions are really flooding in now, but here's here's a good one. Uh, I think Johnson and Johnson concluded sexuality is not binary, but a gradient. Is this basically the same concept you're saying about gender slash sex? About that if sexuality is not, uh, you know, is, is on a spectrum, is that the same for gender? Oh, uh, Johnson and Johnson, I immediately thought of the vaccination. And oh, I, Masters and Johnson. Going, we, Masters. we want Masters and Johnson. Right. That's right. <laughs> right. And it actually wasn't Masters. <laughs> My brain was going in the wrong direction. And it wasn't actually Masters and Johnson who first said that. It was Kinsey back in the 1940s. He was an amazingly uh, uh, ahead of his time uh, in, in, uh, in portraying sexual orientation as being on a continuum, not being a binary. And in my, when I give my lectures on sexual orientation, I point out that thinking of gays versus straights is another example of binary thinking. Yeah. yeah right. So thank you for that. Sure. And to me also, what's interesting, the more I learn about sexuality is it, it is fluid, you know, people change, their orientation can change at various points in the lifespan. And the, the dogma is that women are more plastic that way than men, but you know, Mm, I, I think the jury's still out on that, and um, you do in, hear interesting things uh, in, in prisons and so on. Um, so another question just disappeared. It was about uh, testosterone or hormone receptors. Don't we need to take receptors into account and not just uh, hormone levels? Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. And I think, uh, um, I don't know if studies that have done that, but it would be a good next step. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, the most obvious example of that is uh, XY individuals with con um, complete androgen insensitivity. So they're actually right. lacking, lacking the, the testosterone receptor and they're, uh, they're, they look like girls at birth. And so they're raised as girls and then uh, are psychologically and, and phenotypically female. Um, here's another question uh, prompted by a recent discussion with my child who is a competitive athlete. How do you anticipate gender gradients slash non-binary uh, 
being addressed uh, in competitive sport in the future, which is a great question. And I'll just add, some of you may be aware of these new bills in, in certain state legislatures that are banning trans girls from playing uh, sports. In High school sports, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's like the bathroom bills too, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Some people are, are just really upset about the notion that, it, well, they're upset by any violation of the gender binary, basically. Um, and I, I just, I don't understand the, the bathroom bills, uh, uh, why one would want to spend legislative time on that. But sports, you know, that's a much contested area. And I don't know where it's going to come down. Um, some of the interesting cases have to do with women who have, and I, I Let's see if I can get the term right, or you'll correct me, Lise. Uh, have um, androgenization syndrome, so they have a very high natural level of testosterone in their bodies, even though they have XX chromosomes and so on. So, you know, some people will say they shouldn't be allowed to compete in female sports, but other people will say, well, why focus on that genetic trait? Because there probably are traits. I mean, we know there are traits for bigger muscle mass. So, what you know, if why should we focus completely on testosterone levels in sports? Um, it, it, so I, it's a thorny issue. Uh, I'm glad I'm not on the committees that have to decide it. Um, and uh, one solution would be just to let people compete in the competition they want. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's uh, I, the I I do know that enough that the horm enough to say that the hormone levels is completely useless as a as a uh, categor categorizer for who counts as a woman and not. And uh, so it is It is indeed a, a huge problem for the Olympic committees and so on. But I think at the high school and particularly the pre-pubertal sport level, um, there is, there's no biological rationale for uh, not allowing children to play according to their gender identity. Um, well, we're we're almost out of time. I think I got all the questions of the um, from the audience members. I did want to ask you myself. I've been struggling with this movement for precision medicine, and uh, one of the hallmarks of precision medicine is to start. We have to start by really understanding sex difference, particularly you know starting in animal models and then applying that to humans, and that's going to be the gateway to uh, to better uh, medical decision making. And I, I'm just curious what your response to that is. It, it, it's interesting because the women's health researchers uh, advocates uh, have a different perspective from the, the women's psychology researchers, um, because psychology of women people have really gone in a gender similarities direction, whereas women's health has really, because of the omission of women for, from clinical trials, for example, for so many years, have said, have wanted to argue that there are big differences between males and females, and that's why we have to, um, that's why we have to include women in clinical trials. So it's, it's kind of, in a way, it's a question of political strategy. Um, I can imagine that there are many characteristics better than gender if you wanted to implement precision medicine. Yeah, that, that's, I think, that's, yeah, that's it, my point you know, too. there are many other genes that would be much more powerful. Yeah, yeah even the GWAS studies when the, the, the sex mm -hmm. effects are quite small. Um, well, uh, we need to wrap up. The hour has ended. I just want to thank you for a, a wonderful, very thought provoking talk. Uh, someday I would love to show you our, our wonderful university. It's this beacon for women <laughs> in science. Um, but for now, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'll remind those of you who are registered for CMEs to, to uh, fill out the survey after the seminar. We also have our, our final um, centennial series lecture coming up on May 13th. Debbie Gerbert, who's a, a, a PA, will talk about the history of women PAs, uh, which I think is going to be just really a great capstone for our series. And then finally, I'm going to put in a shameless self-promotion. I'm speaking a, a week from tomorrow at DePaul and um, or uh, by a webinar, which is open to the public. And it kind of riffs on, on Dr. Hyde's presentation. So you can see it's uh, on the origins of gender, brain sex differences, neuroplasticity, and women's advancement in STEM. I hope some of you can, can join me there.
So again, thank you everybody. Thank you so much to our great staff, uh, Nicole Ulibri, Jay Mote, and Kara Bass, and my co-director, um, Christine Burgess. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and hope to see you in a few weeks. Thanks.